when I was much younger, um, applying for one of my first ministry jobs, uh, I was sitting in an interview with a bunch of uh, men from the church, and one of them asked, what's your favorite Bible verse, or do you have a life Bible verse? And I paused because I didn't grow up in the church, um, and so I didn't really have like a life or a Bible verse. You know, they, uh, if the kids go to Awana, they memorize Bible verses. So when they're older and in a job interview, if somebody should ask them, they'll have a favorite Bible verse because they have to memorize Bible verses as part of Awana. But I didn't grow up in the church, and I never had an Awana. So I, I, I paused for a moment. I imagine if I, if, if I survey the congregation, some of you, if I were to say, what's your favorite Bible verse, would have a verse ready because you grew up in that world. People talked like that. That was a common thing. But for some of you, your spiritual journey is too new. Uh, it's, it's too immediate. You, you've, you've never thought in those terms before. And maybe reading the Bible is a new thing for you. So you just haven't accumulated the data for a favorite Bible verse. But I've always been intrigued. Um, and I've always thought about what is the favorite Bible verse for those outside the church? Um, now, obviously, people who don't consider themselves Christians, they don't consider themselves spiritual, they wouldn't claim to be Bible readers, but certain Bible concepts filter through the culture, and sometimes the culture will say, I, that's what I think all Christians should be. Like, um, for example, they might say, um, do unto others whatever you would have someone do unto you, the, the golden rule. And they would say, that thing, that golden rule thing, that do unto others, that's that's the only Bible verse I think that people should pay attention to. Um, another big favorite is God helps those who help themselves, which is complicated by the fact that it's not actually in the Bible. It's not a Bible verse. But people love that verse. They love it even though it's not in the Bible. If I were to think of, until recently, I think the most popular Bible verse among people who wouldn't consider themselves churchgoers is, is the verse we're looking at today, in uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. For a long time, this would have been my main guess for favorite Bible verse. Do not judge or you too will be judged. People love that verse. They like to say, Jesus tells you guys not to judge. And it's right there in the, in, in the text. Jesus is saying, stop labeling people. Stop calling out people. Stop being so self-righteous. You know, everybody should just kind of be. They should let everybody be. They should be able to say what they want to say and do what they want to do without being judged. You're not even supposed to be judging. And, <clears throat> and I say that used to be, I think, the favorite Bible verse. Now, I don't, think, I don't think anybody pays attention to that Bible verse anymore. I don't know about you, but I think we live in a very judgmental generation right now. I mean, everybody is very judgmental. They not only feel the right to judge others, but they practice it uh, by jumping on social media, on Twitter, X, and other handles, and telling everybody what they should and shouldn't do, what is right and what is wrong. We have a world full of, uh, of, of self-righteous people. You know, it used to be my own personal opinion. It used to be that the cultural and political right were the judgmental people. They were the ones who had a narrow view of what you should and shouldn't do. So, you know, 50 years ago at the end of the Vietnam War, it was, there was the political and religious and, and political and cultural right that would say, listen to the government, don't question what the government says, listen to your teachers, listen to your professors, do what is societally acceptable, um, you know, get in line, you shouldn't be rebelling against that. That was all what kind of the right was saying 50 and 60 years ago. The left, on the other hand, was like, hey, why can't everybody just believe what they want to believe? The government should get out of my life and out of my business and let me do what I want to do. You know, they shouldn't, be, they shouldn't be cracking down on moral behavior. They shouldn't be doing that kind of stuff. I should be able to say what I want to say even if it makes my teacher angry. I should be able to say what I want to say even if it makes my professor angry, you know. But now the world has changed because now as the culture shifts, people on the left are now saying, they're the ones who are saying you should believe the government and go along with what the government says. They're the ones that say you should believe your professors, you should believe your teachers. You, and they'll say, these are things you're not allowed to believe. These are things you're not allowed to say. 
These are things that are unacceptable, and we will keep you from saying those things. You're like, this used to be, the, this used to be the, what the right was all about. Now the left is about it. And in my personal opinion, this is just, you know, what do I know? But as the left moves to becoming more self-righteous and judgmental, it's not like the right has gone anywhere. They're still feeling morally superior to the left. So now you just have both sides all screaming at each other and all claiming that they're right. And it could be that one way to understand the cultural shift or the, or the cultural conflict that we all seem to suffer under, um, Arnold Kling is an econo economist, and he published a book a decade ago. And in this book, this, it's an economic book, he, he offered a way to think about the core difference between progressives and conservatives. Progressives, Kling wrote, see the world as a struggle between oppressors and the oppressed. And they try to help the oppressed. So everything in the world falls into oppressors and the oppressed. And we want to help the oppressed. They said that's how progressives feel. Conservatives see the world as a struggle between civilization and barbarism. And they want to help protect civilization. So you can see how that allows everybody to feel morally superior. Because over there here, they're saying, look, we have to address this. And if we have to burn it down to address it, we will. And they'll say over here, whatever you're saying doesn't count because if you're threatening law and order, then it can't be. And it allows everybody to feel so superior. Now, obviously, Kling's assessment is an oversimplification. There are all kinds of people that don't fall into those categories and all kinds of ways that we move it back and forth between them, right? But it is a way of looking at the moral ground that we're in. And I raise all of that because in the middle of all of that, Jesus says, do not judge or you too will be judged. So regardless of how the culture has changed or what the right or the left or the progressive, the conservatives say, Jesus is saying to us, his followers, in the Jesus life, do not judge. So what does he mean? What does he mean? Let's, let's look at it more carefully. Matthew 7, verse 1, says this. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. But Jesus says, do not judge or you will be judged. What does he mean? Is he saying that we can't have any law courts, that we can't hold people accountable for, for speeding and defrauding others and, and, uh, and violence? Does that mean that we can't judge? Well, obviously, it doesn't mean that. The context here has nothing to do with law courts. That's not the context Jesus is talking about. In this context, he's really talking about relationships between individuals and really between people in the same tribe, family, religious community. He's talking about us dealing with others in community and with individuals. So it doesn't really apply to law courts. Uh, the Bible advocates law courts and law and order and all that kind of stuff. Does it mean that we can't discern? Does it mean if we can't judge that we can't decide, you know, who's a better babysitter for our kids, you know, or, or who should fix our car or who should paint our house? Does it mean that we can't discern whether or not somebody's being a good friend or a bad friend? Does that mean that we can't have that kind of discernment? Um, well, I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about because without discernment, you can't even apply the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. This verse is part of a larger section that we call the Sermon on the Mount. And, um, and, and most of it is Jesus telling us how to be salt and light in the world. Light illumines darkness. 
salt preserves from rot. So when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, he's saying, you, by following me, can shed light on a world in darkness. You, by following me, can preserve a culture that would rot much faster. So in order to be salt and light, we have to be able to name the darkness. You have to not participate in the, in, in the rot. So we have to have some discernment. Discernment is one of the keys to biblical wisdom, knowing the difference between right and wrong and how to apply it. So it can't mean that there's no discernment for us. That just doesn't make any sense. So what does he say when he says, do not judge? For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. I think what he's saying is, you are not to sit in ultimate judgment on other people. You are not to pronounce in some kind of elevated way how you think God feels about somebody or even everything about what they may have done. Um, There is a way of judging that says, I know exactly what that person's facing. I know exactly the decision they made. I know everything about their decision, and they are wrong. And you can tell it because you're starting to guess at people's motives. When you say, the only reason they do this is because of this, when in truth, we rarely know anybody's motives, right? We rarely know what's going on inside of a person, and we rarely know what led up to somebody's behavior. But when we sit in judgment, we say, I see that, I declare it that, and more importantly, God says that, or that is always wrong. That kind of elevated sense of judgmentalism, it grows out of a sense of self-righteousness, and it grows out of a sense of, um, of lack of humility, of pride, that I'm one of the good guys, and you're putting these people into another category. So Jesus says, You can't sit in that kind of judgment on other people. You can't. He says, and and he gives two reasons. One, he says, the measure that you use to judge others is the measure that will be used against you. Now, I think what Jesus means by this is that built into the understanding that God is the judge of the world, uh, one of the fundamental biblical truths is, is that God will judge the world. God holds all people accountable. And so one of the senses of God holding everyone accountable is that God holds people accountable for what they know. The Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. So if God has given you a lot of money, what you do with it is you have more accountability. If God has given you many talents or a lot of influence, um, or if he's given you a lot of knowledge, You're you're accountable for all of that. Uh, To whom much is given, much is required. And so when you judge others, you are de facto making yourself an expert on that issue. You say, I would never do what that person does. Therefore, I know everything about what that person is facing. And you're really saying, this is the bar that I'm judging everybody at because I know all things about this. So you say, if I had that kind of money, I would do fill in the blank. Uh, If I was facing that kind of trouble in my marriage, I would do this. If I had a kid in my family that did this, I would do this. And you're saying, what they're doing is wrong. What they're doing is wrong because I know all about that situation. And Jesus is saying, what you're doing is opening yourself up to saying, God, you can judge my marriage, my home, my relationships based on this elevated sense of knowing everything. When in truth, we know very little about what led people to do those things. The discernment would say, It certainly seems to me that this is going in the wrong direction. I don't know what led them, but that seems like a mistake. Or I don't trust where that's going, and I can only decide for me. But that's that's very different than saying, God hates that person, or you are destructive. So Jesus says, don't do that, because you're just setting yourself up to be judged more harshly. The other thing he says is that you, let's be honest, you do not qualify to judge other people. And he's looking at these people and he's saying, look, you you know what you're like? You're not qualified to judge other people because you haven't dealt with the sin and wrongdoing in your own life. He says, I'll tell you what you're like. You're like somebody who, who sees a speck of sawdust in his brother's ear, in his eye, and he says, 
Let me get that speck of sawdust out of your eye. When, when all that time you have a plank sticking out of your own eye. And you can, you can only imagine how, much, how funny this must have been at the time. Jesus was, after all, a carpenter's son. He knew a thing or two about sawdust in the eye. He knew something about planks. And, and I, I picture him picking up a piece of wood and putting it on the side of his head and saying, you know what you're like? You're like a guy who's wandering around saying, wait, let me help you with your eye. And as you turn and spin, you smack him in the face with the boulder, with the plank that's coming out of your own eye. And then you turn and hit this person. And then you can't really see their eye because you've got this big board in your own face sticking out. And everybody is saying like, maybe you're not the best one to judge here. You've got a problem with your own, but you don't see it. Ah, nothing wrong with me. I can see that very clearly. That must be very painful for you, you know? And so by now, everybody's cracking up because Jesus is saying, this is what we're like. We've got issues in our own lives. And because of that, we can't see clearly to address the issue in our brother's eye. So when I started thinking about this, I started thinking, yeah, we do have these planks in our eyes. We have all these things. Maybe that's why we like judging so much. Because it really has been a sociological question to me. How did people that used to be so free thinking and not judgmental become so judgmental and self righteous? And I'm thinking, we just love to judge other people. And I'm thinking, our judgment it either comes from, I'm going to judge you about something that comes very easy for me but might be very difficult for you. You know, that's a very clear way to judge somebody. I'm going to judge that person's work ethic, you know, because I think I know what goes into them trying to get to a decent job uh, because those kind of things came easy to me because I was given all the opportunity to work in the world, you know. And, uh, and let's face it, <laughs> I don't even have a real job. I only work once a week. Who am I to judge anybody? Or we judge because we have a plank in our eye. We judge people harshly when we have the same problem in our eyes. Let me talk personally. I judge more harshly with the things that I have in my own life. That's why I can spot that piece of sawdust because I know what it's like to have sawdust in my eye. You know, I've been there. That's what I, I hate the plank in my own eye. So instead of addressing the plank in my own eye, I'm going to address the sawdust in your eye because we, we judge others because we don't like that about ourselves. And rather than deal with our own shortcomings, our own brokenness, our own sin, we would rather deflect that by pointing it at somebody else. One way to not deal with our own faults is to deflect and judge other people. We get defensive. Somebody says, could I talk to you about you know, this thing? And you're like, well... You're one to talk, you know, because we don't want to address the stuff in our own lives. And I wonder if even this is part of what makes people so, so angry in our world online. You know, if they're over here saying, you know, you can't judge me for my personal choices. You're an oppressor. You're part of the oppressive class. You know, you don't even care about the underclass. And, and that may be true, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't address things in your own life. Or over here, somebody saying, well, if I can prove that you're causing chaos, then I don't have to address any of the issues that you think you're raising. I can just say, that's no way to raise an issue and just pretend that none of the claims that you've made have any validity. It's, we use accusation as a weapon to deflect against ourselves because we don't want, you know, we don't want to address the plank in our eye. There's a certain amount of shame to admitting, you know, hey, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but I'm starting to feel self-conscious about this board sticking out of my face. I don't know if you've ever noticed it. Yeah, yeah, once or twice. I'm afraid that that's what people will say if I start to address things in my life, is they'll be like, yeah, we've been wondering when you'd wake up to that. Ouch, I don't, I don't want to have that conversation. They call them blind spots for a reason. I don't want to look at that. But I think we as Christians have an opportunity in this moment because we can really be unafraid to address the sin, the faults, and the brokenness in our lives. Because we know that the God who loves us has already died on our behalf. In other words, the shame and the guilt that we would feel by addressing the plank in our eye 
God has already paid for that sin through Jesus on the cross. And so when I confess it, God is ready to forgive me. He wants to forgive me. Jesus already paid for my sin on the cross. And God has already demonstrated his love for us. The Bible says God has demonstrated his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So now I get to see myself as one who God has removed this plank and he's beginning to heal the wound. And he's saying, I love you. I realize I've, I've been wanting to take that plank out of your life for quite some time, but you are my child. We're going to work this out. I love you. Now I don't have to deal with that. He's taken my shame. He's taken my guilt. And now that's my identity. My identity is one who has been forgiven much. So now with the plank out of my eye, I can come to the second part of the verse where it says, first, take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck. God's not saying, you got your own problems, so leave everybody else alone. He's not saying that. He's saying, there is a place to address the speck in somebody's eye. I don't know if you've ever had a piece of sawdust in your eye. It's quite painful and uncomfortable. And he says, there is something good about addressing something in somebody else's life, but you've got to do your own work first. And the reason for that is, when we allow God to speak into our lives, when we confess what's really in our lives, and we allow God to forgive it and begin removing it, we address people with a humility that the culture doesn't know. We don't have to be defensive. We don't have to say, if it's that, it can't be that. Or if that's wrong, it can't be. We can, we can address the difficulty of situations because there's a humility in us that comes from being forgiven sinners. We've given up self-righteousness. We have no place for self-righteousness. I have no self-righteousness. My righteousness is based on what Jesus did for me. He forgave a whole lot in my life. And maybe if I were in your situation and Jesus didn't come into it, I'd be, in exactly, I'd be doing exactly what you're doing. I'd say exactly what you're doing. You know, the whole world needs reconciliation with Christ. And there's, there's plenty of oppression and chaos to go around. And so we have this chance to say, you can remove my plank. Because in doing so, I will, I will, know, I, I will know who I am. You have forgiven me. And so I don't have to be defensive. I don't have to hide. I don't even have to be ashamed of what I've done. And, and the place where I see this most effective is in the addiction community. If you've ever been close to anybody who's gone through addiction and found recovery with other addicts, you walk in there and it's like, look, I will be your accountability partner. You call me. And there'll be a time where somebody has to say, look, I need to address what I think you're still fooling yourself about where you are. You know that that's not the right way to go. And I'm not saying that because I'm better than you. I'm saying it because I was an addict longer than you've been an addict. And the only way I found freedom was by being honest. So I'm helping you be honest because I also know what it's like to live in chaos. And so in the addiction community, everybody holds people accountable, but they do so from a place of having been broken. And I think all Christians should be holding each other accountable from that posture and even moving out into the culture addressing things from that posture. We have that opportunity because the good news of the gospel is that Jesus forgives sinners of whom I am the worst, the apostle Paul said. And so we can begin to address the specks in the eyes of people whom we love and who we have relationship with and when God brings it up in our lives. And so what do you do when you go to address the speck and the person says, I don't have a speck you're just saying that because you used to have a log in your eye and you think you're so wonderful. Now, I don't have any problem with that and they don't want to hear it. What do you do when they don't want to hear it? Well, Jesus addresses that because he has this really strange verse in verse six where he says, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, you take that verse out of context, you know, put it on a cross stitch and hang it in your kitchen, it means nothing, you know, except don't give the good food to the dog, you know. But in the context, I think what Jesus is saying is when you go to address somebody and they don't want to hear it, 
When you go to share with somebody about God wanting to have a relationship with them or God wanting to forgive them or for them to address something in their lives and they don't want to hear it, they're acting like animals. Because when we're not connected to God, we are just simply humanoids, you know, animals. And Jesus says, you don't have to keep pressing that. You know, you can pull back and wait for a more opportune time. God's not made, God's not made them, they're not ready. And you don't have to keep banging your head on that door. But I think embedded in that, because of who Jesus is, and because of how Jesus dealt when he himself was accused and when he was crucified, I think that means even if somebody is going to act like a dog when you try to share the truth with them, we still don't hate them. We see them as people who just aren't ready. We're not ready, so we pray for the moment when they were ready. We've all been those people who didn't want to hear it. And they're in that space, so we pray that God will hear it. But we don't have to bang our head against that door over and over and over again. But the point is that in a world where people are angry about what's wrong, in a world where people are convinced that they know why things are so bad and that the problem is that guy, and in a world where people are afraid to look at how they might contribute to it, we have the good news of the gospel. We can unabashedly, without fear, let God speak into our own lives. And then as forgiven people, move out with a deeper sense of compassion. So what better than to go from here to the Lord's table? I'll hand it off to Jack in just a moment after I pray, and we will meet at the Lord's table. Where else, where better to apply this message than at the place where we're all equal? Whether God removed your plank 40 years ago, or whether he's removing it right now, we're all the same when it comes to standing at the foot of the cross. People in need of forgiveness and grateful for it. Let's pray. Father, we see why the world is so angry, chaotic, judgmental. They see great evil and they don't know where it comes from and they're scared of it. But you are the one who conquered sin and conquered death. You've called us to live in this world as forgiven followers. So as we meet around your table, we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us in this time. In Jesus' name, amen.